Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining today's session on the environmental impact of plastic pollution. My name is Rashan, and I am the Iraq Communication Officer at Field Ready. Field Ready is a non governmental, non profit organization which aims to meet humanitarian needs through innovation and technology. It is currently operating Urban Innovation House, which is a co working space as well as a maker space. And it offers different membership packages for entrepreneurs, freelancers, and students. And at the same time, the makerspace offers the latest technological devices for prototyping and manufacturing. We have partners in Baghdad, Mosul, and are also currently launching a makerspace in Slimani. And currently, we are hosting a recycled art exhibition in collaboration with the French Institute. And the aim of this exhibition is to raise awareness to environmental issues and also on how we can use waste materials to create art. Within this art exhibition and within this theme, we're hosting today's workshop on the impact of specifically plastic pollution. This workshop is in collaboration with the Herbal Shapers. And the Herbal Shapers are part of the Global Shapers community, which is founded by the World Economic Forum. I am very happy to have Angie Zohar here today. She is an architect and environmental, an environmentalist, as well as the founder of Earthling Coexistence. And she's also a very active member of the Global Shapers at Herbal Hub. And without any further ado, I will give the mic to Angie now. Just one small note, I will be sharing a link to an attendance form. If you could just take three minutes to fill in this attendance form and thank you very much. Hi everyone. Uh, Roshan, thank you for the introduction. So I think you're all here. Um, before starting, I wanna say, as Roshan said, I'm Angie and I will be presenting today about the impact of plastic pollution. And before we get started, I wanna say that I want it to be interactive. So for example, if I ask any questions, either if the question is something uh, who knows this or who doesn't know that, who wants to say something, you can raise your hand with the, uh, like there is uh, some features on Zoom, or either you can just open your camera or, or the audio, whatever, whichever you feel comfortable. And it will be, we will be like, we will be glad to see you interact with us throughout the presentation. Thank you. So with that, uh, further ado, let's start. The yeah. So before we get started, I want to ask, uh, like, where does plastic come from, uh, or what is it made of? Anyone here knows or wants to give your opinions? Please don't feel hesitant. Just you can open your audio and give your opinions. If you have any ideas of like, where does plastic come from or what is it made of? Well, since there is no one, let's continue with it then. Maybe like most of you don't know, so just, yes, that's correct. It does come from chemical materials, that's true. But more specifically, okay. So it comes from fossil fuels. So which we all know that the head problem of climate change, uh, that's what plastic comes from as well. Plastic is made of from fossil fuels, from coal, gas, and oil, which we can, in the next slides, we, we are gonna get more into it. So how, how much plastic is produced annually? So nine, let's, let's first of all begin with that. So each year, 380 million tons of plastic is produced. And each, the, each person on this planet uses about 500 plastic bags. And if we combine all of it together in a year, like there's five, bil, 5 trillion tons of plastic being used just from plastic bags. That's not, we are not even counting other plastic usages uh, in different industries and in different aspects as well. And, when, but, and most oil companies and corporations and, uh, and brands that use plastic packaging and plastic usage, they're actually trying to 
double that amount of plastic production by 2040. And something else which we know is there are some type of uh, advertising that we can make plastic from organic materials, but that's not true actually. Most like that's a re really low percentage. 99% of all plastic are made from fossil fuels. So besides plastic bags and uh, plastic bottles, can you give me some examples on where we can find plastic in our life? Like just look around you and tell me if you can see any plastic usages, if you could give any examples. You can write in the chat or you can either raise your hands, open your audios. You don't need to raise hands. You can just open your audios and give some examples of where you can actually see that, how much it is in our life, if you could give an example. Anyone here wants to give an example besides plastic bags and bottles? Yes. Uh, yeah, your chair. Yeah, so a lot of things is made from plastics, which even so many things that we are not even aware of has, has been made from plastics that we are not actually even paying attention to it. Some examples of the plastic that has infiltrated into our lives without even realizing is uh, groceries, cosmetics from self-care and everything that encompasses from shampoos, not just makeup when we say cosmetics, from shampoo, detergents, cleaning equipments, so many things. Yeah, laptops as well, the pack, the exterior materials of, of uh, laptops and gadgets as I, it's written electronics as well. So from industri industrial uh, productions as well, when we say industrial, we mean everything from like maybe car uh, parts or maybe our phone, uh, phone, phone parts, anything that you can think of industrially or maybe architecture wise, when we are creating something we need, we have household, household goods as well. And we have synthetic fibers, which is microplastic, that aspect of uh, plastic and gadgets, a lot of gadgets that like it's, it, it's the, 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 that part is so va vast and like it, it's, it's hard to give it a name because it actually includes everything. And we have to talk about this too. Plastic has been around only for one century and it has developed the way we live our lives. So like to a better extent, for example, it has Im improved health in terms of uh, hospitals and how we have much more cleaner stuff. So that doesn't mean plastics in inherently is bad, but what is bad is when plastic was first actually developed, it was actually developed to do, yes, does someone want to say something? No, I think it was okay. So when plastic was first uh, developed in laboratories, when it came to be in the beginning, after, after World War II, that's when it actually skyrocketed the uh, production of plastics. Uh, it was, it was deliberately made to be durable and long lasting. So it's, it's not something to be just used and thrown away. That's, it's not something disposable. It, it, inherently the design of it is not like that. But as we can see, like if it's plastic, if uh, plastic is used as it's intended to be used, of course it's something good. But right now when we see that it's, it's being used for purposes that are totally not compa uh, compatible with how it is meant to be. So when I mentioned uh, uh, synthetic fibers, micro, uh, microplastics, uh, that one is a little bit, I, I don't think many people know about that one because microplastics is, is much more dangerous and harmful than we know of that. Like we can all, we always think of plastic as huge, big like objects that we can see. But most of uh, microplastics actually comes from the fashion industry. We can see at the figure on the right, where most where the other ones are, but thirty I I think it's thirty eight something like that because sorry. Now thirty five percent of microplastics comes from fa the fashion industry, from the clothes we wear, and like everything that you can think of. Either it is makeup or shoes, clothes, out outerwears, homewares, everything that we can think of is made from microplastics, which we know. Mostly when we read the labels of our clothes, it's written polyester or polyamide. And yeah, so that's, that one is problematic, which we are gonna get into it in the, in the next few slides. Before we get, before I show you, I wanna ask an, another question. 
who are the biggest plastic polluters? Do you have any ideas of like, so if, can you give me some examples of maybe brands, companies, like who are the ones right now that are responsible for being the biggest polluters of plastic? Anyone wants to? You can write it in the chat, as I said, or open your audio. Yes, Pepsi and Coca-Cola. Okay, let me show you then. So, of course, there are a lot of other brands, but these are the top in the top 10. We can see that there's Pepsi and Coca-Cola, as they mentioned. We have Nestle, PNG, and Unilever. And if you have ever, when you go to the supermarket and try like shopping, if you ever just like flip the other side, the back side of any ingredient, like any product item, you read the ingredients, you are, I'm sure you have seen these labels on these products. And let me, I'm going to, when we think about these brands, they're not just one, like one brand, they're actually umbrella companies. So we can see how many other uh, smaller brands are like they own it. So I'm going to show you. So before getting to that, yeah, so we know that these are the biggest ones. And some things about Coca-Cola, which I'm going to mention, is that if you can just see the figures of how pollutant Coca-Cola and Pepsi are. So for example, Coca-Cola, every year they throw away 120 billion plastics. Like it's just over 3,800 3, seconds. And they are, they are both named the biggest pollutants. For example, Pepsi doesn't even have a recycling uh, alternative to any of their plastics. Let's come to Nestle. I'm sure if you look at the brands, um, you're going to recognize most of these uh, brands that are owned by Nestle. That's why they're one of the biggest polluters of uh, plastics. Um, and there's at the right side, we have a, I have just given an example when you just flip a, a product, you can see that there's Nestle on it. Uh, I, I mean, if you can just look at the brands, I'm not going to be reading them, but I'm sure you can, you can recognize most of them. And let's look at Unilever. Unilever as well. These products that has been like on our shelves, the supermarkets, everywhere that we go. How much, like what we start to realize when we pay attention how much the plastic is being used. Even most of it is unnecessary to begin with. And PNG as well. I mean, from Pantene, shampoos that we know, detergents, makeups, and this one as well. Most famously, Oreo. You can see Mondelez's label on Oreo as well. Let me show you this small video. So, okay, let's talk about this. 
when we think about the concept of throwing away, like how it's buy and throw, buy and throw, we don't actually conceptualize of how much waste we are creating. And we saw in that small like video, one minute video that companies are creating it without even thinking about the consequences. So, I mean, when you start to think about it, it does become quite like, it is hard to believe that we are, even if it's not a plastic, I don't think anything else that we like buy and throw it in just one second or like five minutes. The, the concept of the idea of throwing away something, even if it's a material, like it's a plastic, something that is invaluable, it is not made for it to be thrown away. So the amount of the, that has been has been thrown away since like the first day that have been created in, after the 1950s until now, it is crazy. So let's talk about it. What the, what role does plastic play in climate change? So actually, uh, climate uh, in for climate change, plastic has a huge role in polluting and contributing to the global warming and everything else that we are seeing. And the reason for that is like air, land, and water. We, uh, when it's burned, it pollutes the air, and when uh, the landfills, uh, the landfills are being polluted with all of it that has been dumped in most, mostly in the in poor countries and th southern countries, like because we know that all of the most biggest polluters. We talked about the brands, but they all, they are all from the we know the first world countries, which are like U.S., China, Russia, Europe, and India. These countries, when they have these waste, they are dumping it on the poor countries as well. And water waste, which is the biggest problem of plastic that has been polluting the rivers, lakes, oceans, every every thing that you can think of, like from our countries, our houses, anywhere that you like that you look at, there is always plastic in water, and it leads to bigger, much more bigger problems that creates other problems that we have to deal with. So, okay, uh, what are the, like, if we go through, where does the problem start? It, it starts with extraction, first of all, because the extraction of oil, while, of course, not every single, ex, like, company or extraction is going to have that much of a big impact of uh, leaking, but we have seen a huge examples of how that, ha that this has happened. I mean, fossil fuels on its own is a, one of the biggest problems, like, the, one of the biggest driving forces of climate change, but also the plastic one is, since th this one is connected to fossil fuels, we see how it pollutes the oceans without pl the plastic getting there after the manufacturing and the transportation of it. And in 2018, uh, like the, pop uh, the pollution from fossil fuels and the aftermath of the plastic pollution, everything else that's made from fossil fuels, 8 million, over 8 million people actually had died from air pollution. And also, for example, when plastic is made, it creates a lot of toxic materials, to toxic aftermaths of it. It's either dumped in oceans or in reverse, as we can see in these photos. So now we saw the what plastic is contributing. Do we have any evidences to back it up and see that it is actually having impacts on the climate earth that we live, uh, live in? Okay, so since 1950, as I said, after the Second World War, uh, the like the the production of plastic increased vastly, and since uh, 1950, 9.2 billion tons of plastic has been made. And if you want to, if we try to uh, visualize it, how much that is, as much as we could, even though that, <coughs> sorry, the number is quite huge, you would need 1,600 great pyramids of Giza. That's how much 9.2 billion tons of plastic is. And to be, to be precise, 91% of all the plastic that has been made from the first day until now, only 8.7 of it has been recycled. All of it that has been made is still around. It's still on our lands in the oceans. So none of them have gone away. And let's see this graph from NASA, which is like throughout millennia, millennia the carbon dioxide uh, percentage in our atmosphere has always stayed stable. It goes down and go goes up, but the change is not that much big. And if you can't see anything here right now, let's, okay, see. After, so the zero, uh, the number zero here, which you can see, is from 1950. We see a, 
uh, an unprecedented uh, like increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So that is not normal. If you can compare it to the other ones and how steeply it has increased, we see that there is a human hand in this. There is problems that we are contributing and it's not something happening naturally. So let's like, how is it contributing? So we know that the greenhouse gas is actually just right uh, below the ozone layer. And the greenhouse gas is like the three main ones, which we have about seven of them. The three main one is carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrate oxide. They're all being trapped within, the, within, within our atmosphere, which are creating the greenhouse gases. And in reality, and naturally, we do have these gases in our atmosphere. But the thing is, they are actually there to keep our Earth warm and not go to, into an ice age and not to freeze up. But that's the problem. We are actually creating another layer of gases that is not letting the heat from Earth that's create, created or the heat that comes from sun to escape. So we are trying, we are trapping that much gases and heat and all of that pollution within the atmosphere. Here's an example to see, which I'm gonna show you in the next graph as well, how the sun has like the, some people say, for example, the sun has some contributions. You can see that from that red heat, we are actually creating the greenhouse gas that are creating that heat. And we are all in this together. I mean, if you say that, for example, oh, like it's not my problem, it's another country's problem. I mean, let's not forget the planet, the atmosphere is actually connected. It's not like there is an ocean between the lands. You can really be connected, but the atmosphere is all over us. Here you can see that the Iridescence, the heat, the sunlight, the sun rays that have been coming from Earth has stayed consistent. It hasn't changed, but the, the temperature on Earth has rise exponentially. So we can see that the, uh, the sun has no contribution here. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is because I have heard, and I, I'm sure you have heard and read that most people that still don't believe in climate change, they would say that, oh, like the sun's position, and Earth position, and the rotation, and all of that, there is like things are changing. That's why, like, Actually, the sun, if you can see from the graph, it ha actually has decreased instead of increasing. So the sun plays no part in that. And I, I, I saw from the figure at the right while I was speaking, I hope that you saw, we see from 1884 uh, to 2019, how much the carbon dioxide concentration in atmosphere has released. I'm gonna play it again to see. Like it, it, the increase is so fast that it's not normal. And it mostly it's all in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, when that much heat is at the no Northern Hemisphere, that creates all of the other problems from the melting of the ices, like the glacier retreats and the polar caps and everything that you could think of. And, and of course, I'm just giving this as evidences. I'm not going into details since that is another topic of climate change and environment since we are just talking about plastic. But these are the, the evidences that we have. So we saw the evidence and let's talk about the causes and the effects. What is causing this and what's like the plastic is there, but what is, okay, so either land or oceans, we can see that the dumping, as I said, from the Southern countries, the poor countries, they're getting hit the most because all of this plastic, I mean, if you think about it, if you see the data as an analysis and all of the figures from around the world, the rich countries, the amount of plastic that they create, it is too much to comprehend. So that's how they're being, there's, there's no one is thinking about, okay, we create that much waste, how are we going to deal with it? So that's where it ends up. I'm um, just another example of two most biggest uses of plastic, for example, every year, only in the USA, so we are not even talking about the other countries, because while the, the most developed countries have they're like creating the most of the problems. At least we have the data. The data are coming from them. People are working, trying to make a change. I mean, in most of the countries, for example, ours, we don't have data. We don't have analysis. Maybe you are even worse. But since no one actually like cares about it, academically, institutions, the government, we don't have these data and analysis to see how much bigger impact we are seeing. So from this figure, we can see that one billion plastic toothbrushes are being thrown away only in the US. 
and 500 million plastic straws every day in the US, that it says that it, it's enough to circle the earth uh, three times. And one of the others is like, we have microfibers, microplastics and synthetic glitter. These are much more bigger because even if we try to actually uh, capture all of the plastic that is on lands and ocean and everywhere, uh, microplastics and all of these smaller ones, which, which get uh, disintegrated and like, you know, from the sunlight and being sitting there for so many long times, these get eaten by animals, they get marine animals, birds. Like when you eat that, we are, we are gonna see the consequences of that. So we can see that animals are like seeing plastic as food sources, they eat it. And the amount of whales and fishes and every type of marine animal that you can think of that has died because, and about like, the percentage is so high, the amount of plastic that has been found in every animal animal's digestive system is huge. Even, even if animals, let's say for in this one, even if let's say animals are not eating like huge uh, chunks of plastic, since there is microplastic in water and everything that they are, they are getting the plastic from it. So we can see how like plastic has infiltrated every millis millimeter and uh, place on earth. That's the consequences. And even for example, let's see that that ribbon around the, our water bottles, how it affects birds. And uh, also there's this video, which is nine minutes. I want you, I encourage you all to watch it, uh, which is talking about how in the oceans where the plastic are. And Russian is going to send it to you. You can find the link of this video on, in the chat box. The health risk of plastic. So we talked that we saw there is uh, how it affects the environment, how it affects the animals. What about us? So, I mean, some people like, you know, we have people that only think about themselves. It's not like you're exempt from these uh, risks and impacts. So let's first uh, try to focus on this one. So for plastic to be durable, flexible, and you know, all of that like make, makes it easy to use. Uh, there's a lot of other chemicals, but the most, the two most, uh, vast like major, the majority of it that has been used is BPA and BEHP. For example, BPA makes plastic bottles transparent, but it interferes with our hormone, hormonal system. And lately this year, especially on last year, we had a lot of research has come out that actually it is, it is significantly affecting the testosterone levels and the, every other uh, hormone that we have, how it interacts with, within our body. And DHP, uh, makes plastic bars much more uh, flexible and it it, it is uh, that like the, all of these scientific researches has made it clear that it's a cancerogenic uh, material like cancerogenic uh, material that's being used chemical in the plastics and it may cause cancer uh, so when all of these materials that that like chemicals that is used with plastic and it gets into our environment it contaminates the our water resources agriculture soil everything that you can think of so when it, it actually also uh, like impacts and encompasses all of that together within the food chains our food chains animals food chains is the biggest like, example we can think of is this chemical this chemical since they are they get broken down. They're eating by phytoplankton. So when we, what are phytoplanktons? So phytoplankton planktons are the smallest, the, the, the one that is below the food chain, the smallest uh, creatures, microorganisms, that all of the fishes actually are feeding on them. So humans eat fishes, but the phytoplankton also play another really important, important role, which is they create 50% of the oxygen on earth. So while Amazon rainforest creates 20%, the phytoplankton create 50%. So that's where the, the information that we have that the oceans create 50% of the oxygen we breathe on Earth, that comes from phytoplankton. And when phytoplankton eat plastics, they have in them and uh, the, like uh, it changes from when, from the, it changes their chemical composition within them and how it travels up to the food chain. And for humans, eight out of 10 children uh, have microplastics in, in us humans, and 93% of people have BPA in their urine. 
also like the impact of COVID on the plastic consumption, we can see that the world uses 129 billion per month and it is used, three, mil, three millions is used in a minute. And we can see, we have already seen the impacts of it in the environment, in the nature, how birds are getting trapped in it, how it is polluting the oceans. And it's important by the way, besides the pollution of it for animals that, to get trapped in, it's always when you, um, by the way, like we are getting to a stage that maybe like we are gonna get rid of uh, masks while there's reusable ones that you can use instead of the blue ones, the surgical ones, you can always, if you use them, try to rip out the elastic of it so that, you know, you just contribute a little bit to like, for animals not to get trapped in. And this is just a figure of when every month we use 129 billion masks per month, it can cover the whole map of uh, Switzerland in a year. And I'm going to show you this video, which is while we don't have so much data from our country, for example, this is Zalam uh, in Hauraman, how it's polluted. It's like the waterfall is so beautiful, but when you look around, it's just disappointment. And there we have another video, which I want you to watch. This is Suleimani City Dump. We dump everything in here, you name it. We don't have a recycling system. We don't recycle anything, so we dump everything in this place, which is very close to the river. We need to fight in a different way, fighting for our nature, for our drinking water, for our wild animals, trees, to save this whole. I will describe this dump as a city dump disaster. I will describe it as a cancer. This is like a bad dream. I always think about it as a, as a monster. This is a cancer we spread it to people. To the people they need. Sorry, is is there a problem with the video? Kak, hello? Can everyone see it? If you can write it in the chat. I just stopped it, by the way. So it's it's not your problem. Was it clear? Can you hear it? Okay, everyone else, can you just... Okay, so should I continue? I will share the videos later then, okay. I'm going to continue. Nature means a lot to me. It's everything. It's my life, basically. I spend most of my time in nature, so nature is my help. I looked at this. Yes, this is Bride and Groom's Gorge. So it's, this is a very famous place. You know, people they come here just for visit selfie and they go back. Oh, this is a selfish one. Yes, yes, yes. This is so beautiful. Yeah, whenever I get polluted psychologically and, and, and uh, so mentally, and, and this is the place I can balance my life. I can have a peace of mind. This is all left behind for the picnic. Just look now. Look now. We stop. Basically, we, you can see that the boat rider is trying to get out, get out of this spot. Uh, this is my favorite spot. But we do clean up in here, in here. so could be people will not pick the kids, but we don't want to take our rubbish back home. So basically we take our cars back home, our kids, but we need the rubbish back home. This is tragic, this is our great people, this is the reservoir. It's not uh, rocket science, you know, taking your bottle, empty bottle back home. Sometimes people ask me, well, what do you do for a living? I say, I help people to think. 
So while we continue to show the other sides of uh, Sleimani, I just wanted, I wanted you to see a glimpse of how much of our rivers is polluted. While we, we may be not aware of it, our media is not talking about it. We don't see it in our digital platforms as well. That's a problem with our country as well. We are not aware of it. No one is talking about it. The people, most people think that climate change, pollution, plastics, and everything else that comes with it, the environmental issues, it's an elitist issue. It's something that only rich countries think about. But we don't think about that. It's our water. It's our reservoirs. It's our air that we breathe in. It's, it relates to our health. So many people die because of the air, just the air that we breathe in and the water that we drink and use. And that's just the, the, the simple things. We're not even talking about our seasons and how like our summer has been impacted like hugely. That's the problem. We need to see much more of these. Much, much more people needs to care about that. Just a few examples of like the styrofoams that we use for food, uh, the disposables, like it, it, it goes away in thousand years and the cap of like coffees and juices, it needs 300 years. We use them in just a few seconds and the water bottles need 450 years. So that's, this shouldn't, we have to rethink the way we use stuff, the way we consume. This shouldn't be this way. Four point five billion years ago, a giant molecular cloud collapses in space, setting free a solar nebula out of which a planet is born, Earth. For two billion years, this planet evolves and first life appears. A soup of cells, bacteria, algae, fungi, a myriad of plants come to life. Fish rain the oceans and eat the algae. They absorb the sunlight and store it in their bodies. Dinosaurs, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, they all live and die. And each year, the dead bodies are covered by layers and layers of sediment. Heat and pressure rise, turning them into yellow black liquid. Humans arrive, and with them, geologists. They study for years to find the oil and build rigs in remote places. Giant pumps extract the liquid, and it's shipped across the oceans. A refinery now cracks it open, and once again, it travels. A factory then binds the compounds and turns them into plastic pellets. Stored in big containers around the world, they go liquefied. They're molded into the shape of a beautiful spoon. The spoon drops and cools off to harden. Wrapped in plastic, it is put into a box, and the box is put on a pallet, and the pallet is put into a container, and the container is put on a truck, and the truck drives to a port, where the container is put on a ship, and ship, 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 the spoon arrives 6,000 kilometers around the world, where it is picked up by a merchant who puts it on a truck, and drives it to a store, where it's placed on a shelf in a temperature-controlled room, where it sits for two months, until you select it and pay for it, with the money you worked hard for, and you drive the spoon home, which is where you are standing right now, with the spoon in your hand. Now tell me, do you still think it's too much effort to use a metal spoon that you just have to wash? Yeah, so I think this video actually like creates a great visual of how much the life of uh, plastic that we use, how crazy it is that we think it's it's normal, like it, when you think, oh, I'm just one person, I'm just gonna use it this one time. It's like 7.8 billion people saying uh, it's just one person. And when you think of it, all of these like effort for it then to be used for a few minutes and then that's it, you use it for a few minutes and it stays on earth forever. So before getting to the solution parts, we saw a lot of, okay, so this part was maybe like most of you, it is sad that how we, how we have come to this point. But before coming to the solution parts, do you have any uh, suggestions like what could be a solution for plastics? And um, maybe what is your opinion on recycling? Please, I, I would be gladly, I would gladly love to hear your voices. And or if you don't feel comfortable, you can write it in the chats. Anyone has any opinions? Maybe what, what do you think the solution is to a plastic pollution? I mean, if you can't think of a solution right now, maybe you can think of uh, like, what, what is something about recycling that maybe excites you or you think recycling is not a solution? 
Um, Angie, we have an answer here. This was sent by Shana directly to me, which is plastic rolls. Sorry, so can you repeat it again? Yeah, her answer is plastic rolls. Uh, maybe Shana, if you want to elaborate on your solution. Plastic rolls. Rolls, Zada. Rolls. I was just, she sent it directly to me. So uh, Shana, if you okay. can send it to everyone in the meeting. Oh, I will just copy paste. She wrote plastic roads. Plastic roads. Okay. But I, I thought she said rules. No. Mm. Oh, sure, I can repeat the question. I said, what uh, we talked about all of the, like, it is sad we see how plastic is being used and its impact. So let's come to the solution parts. We talked about all of these uh, sad parts of it. What do you think a solution to plastic pollution is? And if you don't can't think of a solution, what is your opinion about recycling? Yeah, hello everyone. So about recycling. Um, so in general, recycling economically, it's not that uh, like sustainable economic from an economic side. It really takes a lot of energy, effort, money to recycle plastic to the point that it doesn't make to re a sense to recycle it on a large scale. Uh, what I see like a more as a solution is more going to towards reuse and re-adaptation of the, the plastic waste putting it into another, another resource that we can use it. Great point. Thank you. Thank you so much for contributing. Okay, so I'm going to move on if we don't have any others. Okay, so let's talk about the solutions. So before getting the solution, maybe some people think that uh, like recycling is one of the parts of the solutions to uh, plastic pollution, but as uh, one of you mentioned as well. So to be honest, recycling is a scam. And the reason for that is throughout uh, like hundreds of years, like we have had since the beginning of uh, 1900s, we only 8.7 of plastic has been recycled, as I mentioned before. And to be to be accurate, it's not actually recycled; it's downcycled. So, as like let's say, whenever something is recycled, whenever like a plastic bottle is recycled, it's actually recycled to something that is not that much useful. And at the end of the day, it still gets thrown away after a few uses. And something else which is important: most of the companies, the corporations, the brands that we know of that actually push the agenda of recycling, they're it is not true. They're washing. Uh, they're uh, using the technique of greenwashing, which I'm gonna explain to you as well what greenwashing is. And let's say before getting to that, let's say recycling is a solution. To be there, we have seven types of uh, uh, plastic types, and only two of them is recyclable. The first one and two. The fifth one, which you see a uh, tick underneath it, it's moderate. Like it's sometimes recycled, not always. The other one, ones are never recycled because they are not recyclable. I mean, here we can you can see some examples of the plastics and most of the time when you buy something you can when you look at the back you can see what type of plastic it is we, i'm sure you all of you have seen these numbers maybe before like i didn't know to as well like what are these numbers but we can see how it is used in our daily lives and none of them actually are even recyclable even if we say recycling is a part of a solution to that let's take a, a, another example of how much these things uh, their lifetime, uh, like balloons never get recycled. And for example, some stuff takes like thousands of years, uh, like hundreds of years. So we can see how how that their lifespan, even if let's say they have been created in the 1950s, they're still around and they're gonna be around for the next few generations. And that's not just one or two. And I love this quote that I wanted to share with you. So I think that our, uh, our minds should, um, should think like that, our moral ethic, ethics of companies and everything else. If it can be reduced, reused, repaired, rebuilt, refurbished, refinished, resold, recycled, or composted, then it should be restricted, redesigned, or removed from production because it doesn't make any sense. And I mean, I don't know about anyone of you, and I'm sure most of you could agree with that. Like, if something is not useful, 
then it should be redesigned. Maybe it's not, it isn't, it isn't meant in the beginning. It wasn't even meant for something, for plastic to be used for such a uh, daily, like, task that is not actually meant for it to be. I'm gonna, uh, so when we mentioned that companies use greenwashing, what is greenwashing? So the greenwashing is the process of conveying a false impression of brands actually having an environmental, uh, like an environmental aim, which they don't, it's mostly marketing strategies. And most of the labels that we can see um, brands use are these labels like biodegradable, eco-friendly. And we have seen a lot of, you know, plastic bags, bottles and utensils that says it's biodegradable. It's some made from organic materials. To be honest, even biodegradable ones, need factories need uh, it, it's not going to be biodegrade in nature it needs special equipment so while these labels you know a recycled cotton light green organic sustainable these words as like they're actually these words has a positive uh, outcome for sure but just as like lying company, none of the companies, there isn't a rule, governmental or, or like international law that prohibits companies or brands from using these labels. So they could use these labels, just how like you can tell someone in public that, oh, you're lying about that, that thing. And we can see this, which was a meme over internet, how this bottle says, hello, I'm paper bottle. But uh, to be exact, actually, this is just a marketing strategy, how it's wrapped in, it's a plastic wrapped in paper. While there are brands that actually are, for example, eco-friendly, 100% natural and all of that, but to how, how should we detect it? So let's first of all, which is important, not just for plastics and everything else, let's not just bypass the packaging and it says, for example, on the top of it, oh, it's 100% natural. We should always read the ingredients, the labels at the back. And the reason for that is they actually, companies can't lie about the ingredients. The reason for that is most of the time, it is required health-wise because of health risks, because some people have uh, uh, like allergies and you know all of that things that they can consume or use or even get close to. So there are some rules health-wise that they have to mention. That's why labels can lie. So it's always important to look at the ingredients of products and see if actually there is some bad stuff in it. And be aware of brandings. When you see, for example, a brand or a packaging, it's all green and it all says bio and you know eco-friendly. It could be a, just a marketing strategy as well. That's like this. The, the, these are just some points. And there are and look for proofs. There are some labels, of course, not all of them. That there are uh, like monitored by governments and institutions are re reliable, and you can look for them. And first of all, before even getting like trying to look for all of these know what green actually means like if you don't know what green means when something is green and eco-friendly then you could be tricked into like believing the company and last of all be skeptical and do your research and i i we think i think we live in in an age that we all have internet we all have our phones it's just we are two clicks away like just opening your phone and searching if this thing is true or not and there's there's a lot of information about all of these companies that they sell their stuff to see, see if they're actually greenwashing of their products is really uh, eco-friendly. And which this one is important as well. Yeah. I think we should uh, rethink our choices, refuse single use uh, as much as we could because I don't think single use is even meant to be when we live on a planet that our resources are finite. Reduce our consumption when we don't need something, we don't have to buy a lot of it. Reuse everything, refurbish all stuff. Repair before we replace something, which we live in an age that when something breaks, we don't think about repairing it, which is, I think we can go back to the old way of some things we can leave behind that's bad in the past, but some things we can go back to and they're important. Repurpose, being creative and recycling should be the last option because it is not actually uh, a, a, an efficient solution to plastic pollution. And before I give you some examples of how we can improve in our daily lives, I, mean, I know this is a huge problem. I mean, maybe most of you are thinking, well, this problem is not going to be solved by me. You're right. This is a governmental, like it's, it's like civilians, the populations of our, of our countries, how we live. 
it is two forces like governments should have some laws and bills passed for for to help uh, hold uh, companies responsible but at the same time as consumers we do have we do have the power as well we need to be aware of what's going on because we live in an age that we actually can what well, i mean while our country may not be the best about this but we can start somewhere i mean plastic is in the uh, top five uh, causes of climate change I and mean, we fossil fuel on its own without thinking about the plastic of it the two driving biggest forces are animal agriculture and fossil fuels while we are talking about plastic uh, waste only today i wanted to mention that so you know that it is important like how our governments work we should pay attention to I mean, this might sound a little bit mm, icky to most of you, but we don't, we, we, I don't see anyone in our governments. We should, maybe some of you, uh, like we are the leaders of the future, most of you maybe already. So we can make changes. It is at the end of the day, it is our responsibility. We are living on this planet. We are sharing uh, this house, this environment, the everything around us, the way we live and consume. It is our responsibility. If not me, if not you, then who? So I'm gonna give you some of examples, which I could like, yeah, I, we would be here for days if I give you all of the things that are in supermarkets, but I just wanted to give you a simple example. When you show like small changes makes a huge difference as I even show you in the video, like it's don't think about it, just one spoon, it's just one package, it's just one bag. It's like, when you see these, try to swap them with these. For example, you see, a, we see a product that ha it is maybe in a uh, reusable bag, it is in a carton a box instead of a plastic, use the more uh, eco-friendly one. For example, uh, any sauces, ketchup is, or whatever it is that you use, there's plastic ones and there is, there are in glass ones as well. Everything, you have choices actually, we do have choices, but we, I don't think that the awareness is lacking in us. And let me show you another example that actually, I mean, we have uh, Arab Innovation House here with us, we, which they have a lot of great examples, like they can support people. I mean, we need ideas. For example, this is a market, a shop in uh, London, that's all uh, reusable, refilling that. So there are solutions, we can do something. It's not like we don't have any choices and we are doomed, that's it. I'm just trying to show you examples that we do have solutions if you want to work on it. And plastic bottles, I'm, I'm sure you all know, like we can reuse plastic bottles as just like the most basic one. And we have actually, so you don't care about any of the other steps. Think about your money, like think about your pocket, how much you would save in a year if you just use a reusable bottle. You can see the numbers here, you don't need me to read it for you. And let me show you this, for example, at the top we have some uh, examples like farmer markets going to so try to shorten your chain of like shopping i mean if you look at it because the longer it gets the longer packaging and uh, like how it should survive you know being in uh, trucks that should be in the right uh, temperature and all of the plastic uh, like wrappings and packages so if you go to like farmers markets local places local brands it's always the best uh, choices that you have instead of mass production, mass companies. And at the bottom left, I want to show you an example of which is, I don't know if I know if you, uh, uh, personally, it does drive me crazy when you look at it, for example, at the grocery stores, we have Catherine Erbil, everything is wrapped in plastic. It's like potatoes and tomatoes already have a layer of protective. Why would you need to wrap them in plastic? Everything is, it's so unnecessary. Maybe some things, for example, hygienic wise, or we need it to be clean. So maybe plastic could be a little bit, while you have the choices for it, it could be used, but we use plastic for so many unnecessary stuff. And we do have glass bottles, glass water bottles as well in Erbil, which are very cheap. I mean, I don't know if you can see the, uh, their prices, but we do have alternatives in Erbil as well. I mean, if here people are parents, I mean, you can, in every aspect of our life, you can decrease the use of plastic. I mean, from children's toys, you can always go to more eco-friendly ones, like woods, stuff that is actually in nature instead of plastic. I mean, instead of throwing away, I, I, I wish our, oh, we had a system of uh, composting, but we can do it in our homes as well. Instead of throwing away everything, 
It could be good for our gardens. We can do composting. I mean, it's just small stuff. When you go out, when you order ice cream, I know this seems small, but I'm trying to make you think about all of the small things. You don't need to go big. You don't need, like maybe some of you might be scared. Oh my God, how can I do all of this together? But you can make small changes instead of some like a spoon and a cup that could be thrown away. You can order an ice cream in, a, in their cone. And we talked about uh, uh, fashion and the polyester and synthetic fibers. Even all toiletries, we can, before going to that, I want to like remind you how the fashion industry has creates plastic pollution. So these are the uh, fabrics to avoid. And these are the sustainables that we have. I mean, we should always try to, even polysters and all of these polyamide based, like plastic based fabrics that we, they're bad for our health, for our skin, our body doesn't breathe. It's not even useful. Like it's not the quality is good. You wash it one or two times and you see all of this, like you can see here, all of that fuzz come out from the product. And there we have a lot of options, like from toothbrushes, toiletries, self-care, everything. We do have options. And at the end, you might say, well, why should I care, right? Sorry. So according to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we have until 2013. So we only have 10 years left before the, before, uh, the climate change is irreversible. So we can't do anything about it after 2013. And we only have 8% of the carbon budget that we, ha uh, we have left. If you ask what is the carbon budget, it is the amount of carbon dioxide that we could, all of the greenhouse gases that we can put into atmosphere before it's just like, you know, as I said, irreversible. And we should stay below 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. 1.5 1 degrees Celsius may sound like small, it's like, what is 1.5? But it's not a 1.5 for a month or a day. It's like when you think about centuries and decades, if like the environment even, if we reach above two percent, we like even below it, we might go into ice age. That's how delicate and sens sensitive the environment of our ecosystem and Earth is. I'm gonna show you which this uh, GIF. Uh, it's going to show you how the carbon budget is right now, from the early 1900s. How much we have left. This is going to show you the 8% of the carbon budget. That's how much we have left for, for the atmosphere to be able to absorb all of these carbons that we are putting in it. And I wanna end it with this. I mean, we should think about it uh, to be realistic. I mean, nature doesn't need humans. I mean, if humans got just like, went out of existence in a like second, nothing is going to happen to the nature, but if we destroy, the nature, the environment, and the animals, humans can survive, we do rely on them. So I think this could, I mean, this puts it into perspective. Yeah, so thank you so much everyone for being here and listening to this. I hope it was thought provoking and thank you for even being interested in it.